Wars destroy lives and property. It destroys trust between nations, and it creates an air of fear and paranoia. It's generally regarded as a really bad thing. Even wars that were arguably necessary still marked years of even the good guys sinking to many levels of brutality before the entire thing was over. As many think of it, war often brings out the worst of man's inhumanity to man. However, war can also do the opposite. Sometimes war is punctuated by many moments of hope that remind us that even in the worst of times, the very best traits of humanity can shine through regardless. Number 10. The Great Emu War in Australia In the early 1930s, Australia was going through a rather tough time. Like a lot of the world, Australia was going through a depression, and in terms of farming, things were looking rather bleak. Farmers were hoping for subsidies from the government that never showed up, and people were worrying that the economy was not going to stay together in any way. There was very little confidence in the government at the time to fix the situation. To make matters worse, many emus started to migrate to the area and soon started destroying crops and destroying fences, which allowed rabbits in. Australia decided to declare a war on emus and launched the Great Emu War. Most people would imagine a war on wildlife would involve lots of shooting permits and people hunting the species, eating them, and perhaps getting a little more food on the table. Instead, the Australian government actually made it a legit military operation, perhaps because they wanted to put on a show for the farmers and regain their confidence. The hope was that with machine guns they could easily mow down the emus by the thousands. However, the emus proved to be really good at dodging, and as soon as the shooting started, they would scatter. After a few weeks of intense failure that only saw a few hundred emus killed at most, although the commander of the operation estimates only about 50, the whole thing was put to an embarrassing close. While the operation was ridiculous, no humans were harmed, and it helped bring some optimism and humor to a very tough situation. Number 9. Miltschuppe, the soup that ended a war in Switzerland. Back in the middle of the last millennium in Europe, perhaps the most contentious issue was the ongoing battle between Protestant and Catholic factions, both within and between various countries and powers. Switzerland was no exception to this type of conflict, and during the First War of Kappel in the early 1500s, there was looking to be a potentially very bloody conflict between large factions of Protestants and Catholics, respectively. The two sides had marched to war and their leadership were negotiating, trying to see if there could be a peaceful end to the conflict. It looked at first like negotiations were going to fall through and a horrific loss of life would occur. However, something amazing happened. While the leadership was talking, the soldiers, who were all fellow countrymen, were bonding over a bowl of soup. The soldiers, who had marched all the way to the fight, had brought a lot of bread with them, and the locals had a lot of fresh milk to go around. Both sides were quite hungry and pooled their resources to make a delicious bread and milk soup that was shared all around and averted a potentially very bloody battle. The soup is known as Miltschuppe, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, and while it is not exactly regularly eaten in Switzerland, it has a very important place in their traditions. Even today, if politicians are quarreling, they eat the soup together in order to help resolve their differences. Number 8. The Singing Revolution That Freed the Baltic States From Soviet Rule After the end of World War II, the Iron Curtain fell dark and hard with a cold snap across much of Eastern Europe. For many decades, these countries were under the thrall of the merciless Soviet Union, who tried to seed their countries with ethnic Russians in order to cement their hold. The Soviets were brutal and forced censorship, tried to remove the nation's national identities whenever possible, and always favored ethnic Russians. Instead of going to war in the traditional sense, the Baltic states decided to try an entirely novel and peaceful way of regaining their freedom. Starting in the late 80s and slowly but surely gaining steam, the Baltic states staged massive singing demonstrations on a regular basis, often singing songs that protested the Soviet occupation and their treatment of their countries. However, this all culminated in June of 1988, when over 100,000 Estonians gathered outside under the guise of singing in order to protest the ongoing Soviet occupation. This powerful gathering of people, this incredible commitment to sing for their national identity and freedom, bore surprising fruit. Within three years of keeping the pressure up and using entirely non-violent methods, the Baltic states had all managed to wrest their freedom from Soviet control. Now, this doesn't always mean that singing or protesting works, but it does go to show show that protesting in a peaceful way can be sometimes effective. The huge solidarity in numbers and the nature of the protests allowed for something incredible to happen all across Eastern Europe. Number 7. The Cattle Wars Only Shot Fired Hit a Cattle On Board A Ship 
1784, the Dutch Republic of the Netherlands and the Austrian Netherlands were in a bit of a conflict. The Dutch had blockaded off a river called the Scheldt for a trade, and this was angering the Austrians, who felt that they should be able to use that trade route to increase their own revenue. In October of 1784, Emperor Joseph II decided to send a fleet of three vessels in order to attempt to reclaim the route. However, the battle almost immediately took a hilarious turn. Only a single shot was fired from the Dutch ship the Dolphin, and it hit a kettle on board the Le Lewis, the lead ship of the Austrian fleet. The commander of the fleet was so terrified that he decided for some reason to immediately surrender his entire fleet. This action allowed the Dutch to retaliate and take a nearby fort. Emperor Joseph II was enraged and declared war, but he did not immediately set out to attack anyone, probably because it would have been quite expensive to do so, and his first attack didn't go so well to begin with. The Dutch remained quiet for a while, as they were not sure how to respond to this aggression none of which had been started by them, but eventually started preparing a fleet for war. However, it turns out that due to a pact they had with Great Britain, they weren't actually able to use these ships that they put together to attack the Austrians. Indeed, the entire idea was abandoned and the war soon officially ended. In the end, the only actual shot fired in that war was the shot that hit the kettle aboard the Le Lewis, and the resolution was, for the most part, just status quo antebellum. Number 6. The Christmas Truce of 1914 reminds us all we are just people in the end. World War I was, of course, one of the bloodiest and most brutal conflicts in known human history, and needs no real introduction. It was one of the first wars with true weapons of mass destruction like machine guns, but no one had really figured out the best way to defend against these weapons. This made for a war with very low morale and very high casualties on both sides. The whole thing slogged on and on and didn't show any signs of ending anytime soon. While it was unofficial and not supported by high commands or done by everyone, countless soldiers on the Western Front created their own temporary truce on Christmas Day of 1914, and walked into no man's land to exchange gifts, souvenirs, swap bodies and prisoners, and even sing Christmas carols together. The reason this didn't happen in future years is because High Command felt that it was inappropriate. Number 5. The Time of War was almost fought over the shooting of a single boar. Many people have heard of the Boer War, but not so many people have heard of the Boer War, also known as the Pig War. The war goes back to 1859, when the United States was still expanding. The British, they still controlled Canada, and the two were sort of trying to decide where all their boundaries officially lay. The two countries had already been through two wars, and no one really wanted another full-blown war between the two countries, which would be three in less than a hundred years. But things they started heating up over a small land dispute. The San Juan Islands, now considered part of Washington State, were hotly disputed between the two, and it wasn't really properly laid out in the most recent treaty as to who officially owns them, so both countries started trying to stake a claim. The British sent a sheep farmer to start populating the island with his flock and setting up shop. And at first, the British, they had it to themselves. However, the Americans then sent a few settlers of their own who started farming crops and preparing to stay there long term. One of the American settlers saw a boar eating his crops and got angry and shot the boar. After it turned out that the boar belonged to the local British sheep farmer, he offered compensation, but the farmer gave a figure that he found insulting, and the two sides found themselves in a nasty standoff. The Americans sent troops to the island, and the British sent ships to stand off the coast with troops that could have easily squashed the American presence if they really wanted to push the issue. In the end, President James Buchanan sent General Winfield Scott to negotiate a peaceful end to the situation and managed to end the entire thing without further hostilities. The truth is that people on both sides had seen combat previously, and none of them wanted any loss of life over a single boar. Not long after, the United States found itself embroiled in the Civil War and forgot all about the situation for a while. Number 4. The time a bunch of young Confederate soldiers got in an epic snowball fight. The Civil War was one of the most brutal wars in history, and easily the saddest war in United States history. In many cases, it was literally brother against brother, or family against extended family, and oftentimes the people fighting the war didn't really even fully understand what they were fighting for, or why. One thing that many people don't realize at first about the American Civil War is that the majority of the people fighting the war, especially as it dragged on, were barely adults or only 15 to 16 years of age, basically a bunch of kids, especially when it came to the South nearer the end of the war. Many people also died of dysentery or other diseases before they even got a chance to fight. 
Many people villainize the South, and for good reason, considering slavery, but it is important to remember that many of the soldiers were just children who were easily duped into fighting. These children were having an absolutely horrific time as they watched their brothers, cousins, and friends die around them. One day, on January 28, 1863, there was a large contingent of Confederate troops from several states stationed in a valley in Virginia, and it snowed heavily, absolutely blanketing the area. While most grizzled adult soldiers would hunker down and complain about the weather, the young Confederate soldiers decided to have a of fun and started a spontaneous snowball fight between two Texas divisions. When they won, they attacked a division from another state and then teamed up again from there. Before long, several state divisions had put together a gigantic and well-organized snowball fight that lasted several hours. Unfortunately, General Longstreet, who was in charge of the area, decided that the slight damage it had done to the troops was too dangerous and banned further snowball fights. While the Civil War was a very sad and violent period in America, this incident reminds us just for a moment that so many of these soldiers were mostly just children, not battle-hardened warriors, and that if given the chance, they could have had entirely different lives. Number 3. In World War II, it was discovered that many soldiers simply didn't want to kill. War is brutal, depressing, and often brings out the very worst in humanity, at least as far as most cynical people will tell you. However, war often brings about the humanity in people and shows us what we're really made of. The truth is that most people are not particularly cruel or violent and wouldn't harm another person unless they had no other choice to save their own life. While it may be easier to shoot someone if you are directly confronted with a gun, and perhaps a little easier the next time, it takes a lot of killing before most initially stable people can kill with ease. According to a study after World War II by SLA Marshall, a famous war historian, only 15-20% to of soldiers willingly fired their guns at the enemy in most situations where their life was not directly threatened. Most soldiers simply did not actually want to kill in the moment unless they felt forced to for some reason or another. Now, The methods of his study, Men Against Fire, have been criticized since, and some argue with the exact percentages, but no one has tried to deny his general thesis. The fact of the matter is, psychologically, it is hard to kill without extremely adverse circumstances, a lot of conditioning, or perhaps mental instability. The military has taken note of this, and now often trains people with cutouts of enemy soldiers instead of just bullseyes to further condition them to shoot enemies on sight without thinking too much about it. Number 2. Vietnam War protesters tried to levitate the Pentagon. They even got a permit first. The Vietnam War was already one of the most bizarre and tragic wars in modern history. It was one of the first of its type of proxy war, and it slogged on for many, many years and never really came to much of a satisfying conclusion for anyone involved. Oftentimes, the war involved little actual direct fighting, and bad weather drew things out even longer, especially when fighting in the jungles. In the United States, the mood over the war was restive and grim. People were getting increasingly tired of having their children or themselves sent off to die in what looked like an increasingly increasingly pointless war. The counterculture movement was at its peak, and Michael Bowen, Allen Ginsberg, Jerry Rubin, and several other prominent activists planned a march on Washington for October 21, 1967. The idea was that it would make a big political statement and hopefully bring an end to the war. However, while at first the planning was going normally, it started to quickly take a turn for the weird. Rubin suggested that they march on the Pentagon instead of Washington so people would see that they were against war and not against democracy. This was fine, but then Bowen, who was known for studying occultism and shamanic activities while dropping acid, suggested they use mystical rituals to levitate the Pentagon into the air. Now, Many group members did agree to try symbolically, but as far as we can tell, Bowen actually believed it would work. Indeed, in order to drum up publicity, they even got a permit to do it, although the permit only allowed for 3 feet and not the 300 feet that Bowen claimed he was going to do. Unfortunately, but not exactly surprisingly, the Pentagon stayed in place. Number 1. Many Russian women were celebrated for their combat skills in World War II Most countries have a pretty poor track record when it comes to women in their country in general, especially when it comes to the military. If you were a woman who really, really wanted to join, you were unlikely to be allowed to even back in the times of emergency like World War II. This is unless you wanted to do something like nursing. Open combat was completely out of the question. However, while Russia was like that at first, like most countries in World War II, they decided that necessity outweighed pride and, over time, allowed in quite a number of female snipers who proved to the entire world how incredible female warriors can be. 
The first trailblazer was Ludmila Pavlichenko, who wanted to join the ranks of the Soviet army and fight against the Nazis, but was denied despite having incredible skill with a rifle. Eventually, they agreed to let her show them her skills, and despite her being a woman, they were impressed enough to allow her to join, and she quickly earned a place of great distinction. She had 309 confirmed kills, but may have had more that were never witnessed. Her confirmed kills alone place her in the top five of all known snipers. While her contribution was great, and she helped get things rolling, we cannot ignore the other roughly 2,000 women in the Soviet Union who served as snipers and were all known for their skill. 500 of these women would go on to survive the war, something many of their male counterparts in all parts of the Red Army didn't achieve. Unfortunately, while Russia paved a trail at the time that would have made a great example for the rest of the world to follow, it is still rare to see a woman allowed to participate in combat, and if anything, Russia has gone backwards on the issue since then. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below. Also, don't forget to check out our other channel, Biographics. Find a link to that on the screen now, as well as a video from that channel. And as always, thank you for watching.